This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And this week we're joined by composer and friend of the show, David T. Little. He'll be talking to us about Shenandoah University's new initiative, Shenandoah New Music, featuring a series of performances throughout this inaugural 2013-14 season, featuring artists such as Monica Jamino, Todd Reynolds, Jeremy Dank, and Alarmo Sound. And also this April, some of these artists will participate in what is being billed as Andreessen 75, a D.C. area festival celebrating Louis Andreessen's 75th birthday. David, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you guys again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. And there was actually an event last night, correct? There was, yes. We had our launch party last night at this new venue in downtown Winchester. There's a great pedestrian mall in downtown Winchester, Old Town, they call it. Yeah. And there's this very kind of LPR-style venue that just opened uh, maybe a couple months ago. And half, I would say a good half of our new music events are being held there because it has all the tech stuff we would need, good vibe. There's a bar right, there. Right. You know? And so <clears throat> last night we had our launch party. We did a performance with our brand new ensemble, which we've called Edge Ensemble of Terry Riley's NC. And um, I was very happy that it was, I think it was a good NC. Um, <laughs> so I think it, went, it, was a, it was really good. So that was exciting. And the audience seemed to be really into it. We had about 175 people come out, nice. which was way more than I was anticipating for a first, for sort of a first go in a, in a place not necessarily having a history of new music presenting, you know. So, so yeah, it was really. I think it was a really successful event and it was a good start to the season. And now, now I'm getting ready for the next one, which is okay. in less than a month. Wow. Very cool. So they are these probably going to be a, a month. Is it a monthly series that we can expect? Pretty much, it amounts to that. And and sometimes multiple things per month. So in November we have three shows. Uh, one there's a series called Ear Candy, <clears throat> which is a is a more open curated sort of thing. So people, students or faculty can say, Hey, I have this cool piece I want to do. Can I do it there? And you know, if we can make it work, we make it work. But then also in November is um, the Kevin puts uh, visit. So he's coming into town for about three days. So we have a Pulitzer festival. So every year we bring a Pulitzer prize winning composer to campus for three days. Uh-huh. And so two shows of his music in November. And I think, is that all for November? I think that's November. And then early December we do on silent night. Uh, on the pedestrian mall with Phil Klein, who's going to come in and sort of kick that out. And hopefully that'll be an annual thing. So a lot of firsts this year, which is really exciting. And, and all good people, great players, great composers coming in to visit. Um, I was looking at the list, and I was first very excited by the sort of amount of stuff that we put together. And then I suddenly got very afraid because I realized I had to do <laughs> all of those shows. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I think it's... A little- it can look a little daunting when you see all these people that are supposed to be coming down and uh, you got to put it all together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I luckily have a lot of help here. Damon Talley, who is the wind ensemble conductor and is also the conductor of the edge ensemble. He, you know, been great. Garrick Soder, our um, clarinet professor, Earl Yowell, our professor. And then we also have some students, some graduate students who are assisting. And so it's a team that's making it happen. It's not just me doing everything. So, cause if I don't think that could be, Yeah, that would be pretty difficult. Um, it's it's a huge undertaking. Any kind of this kind of festival is just a, a monstrous, monstrous task. Um, can you tell us just a little bit generally about um, like where where this is coming from? Like what what some of the 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 idea behind starting a big project like this is? I mean, obviously it's a big undertaking, and I'm I'm I and I know there's a lot of new music in the the area. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, why did you decide that you needed to contribute this, this massive amount of work to your workload? Well, you know, part of, so I have two parts to my job here. One is I'm the director of the composition program. And so I'm rewriting the curriculum and I'm organizing the studios and I, you know, I have, uh, there are three composers on faculty here, Tom Albert and Ruby Fulton and me. So that's the one part of it. Um, and really, this, the whole Shenandoah New Music thing is in service of that. You know, I was thinking, what, what is the sort of thing that will make a place really attractive to student composers to either come for, we have an undergraduate program and a master's program. 
And I thought, well, what if every year there was a Pulitzer winner here and they would have master classes? What if every year there were there was this whole just you know flurry of events that made new music really central to the experience for the whole university? You know, that new music is really at the core of what happens at Shenandoah period, not just in the composition department, you know? And so little by little, this idea, this is all in the last little by little, it just came together and we did, we added one show and then we added another show and, you know, um, it, uh, it just sort of took on a life of its own, but it's really, I mean, it is really geared, you know, because it is a university and because I am a professor here, I do have to keep in mind how this is, you know, how benefits the students here. And that's why, you know, with Edge Ensemble, it's not a faculty ensemble, it's a faculty with their best student ensemble. So in C, you know, you had clarinet students with the clarinet faculty and, you know, and also, so it gives an opportunity to play with their own teachers from other instruments, which is just, I think, an invaluable learning experience as a young performer to get to play with really high level people just, and just have to, you know, not lesson situation, but just really real life performance situation that's very so, cool and what so you're and you're bringing in a lot of uh pretty huge names to work with this uh the list of of composers and performers running through your schedule is is very impressive and i i was telling the guys before the show that it, it seems very ambitious for your first time uh through this this festival yeah um which is cool congratulations on 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 <laughs> bringing in all these these great people Part um, of the and and I'm sure it's a great opportunity for your students to work not just with their instructors that they see all the time but to get a lot of the I assume a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with some of these these great uh, guests yeah yeah and master classes especially uh, we're still I'm still working out some of the details if there will be private lessons but I'm hoping that we're, there can be I mean that's you know it's always sort of a question right. that is up to the individual um, right. Like I, I don't necessarily imagine that like Louis is gonna want to do that necessarily, <laughs> but maybe he will, you know. And I'll, I'll, I'll check it out and see. But um, but yeah, and also the chance to meet really high level performers and have them not just kind of blow through town, but you know, like having Todd Reynolds here for three days, doing a workshop and and talking about his his sort of entrepreneurship. I mean, that's a big part of this program too, which has really always been a part of what I've done. But you know. In, in the new curriculum, there is actually going to be a practicum where every, in the first two years of study, every composer has to assistant project manage a concert. And in the second two years, they have to lead project manage a concert. Nice. So they, they get actual real world experience making sure they don't forget to print program and make sure their <laughs> stuff <laughs> in the hard way. Um, I'm trying to, that I learned the hard way sort of outside of school um, or inside of school, but just kind of on my own without any real guidance. Um, you know, here, you know, both Ruby Fulton and I have a lot of experience with that and we can sort of help teach, teach how to do that, you know, so that when they get out and into the real world, they have those tools and can help that can then help them get their music out there by putting on shows. I mean, that's really what, how I've done a lot of what I've done is just by putting my own shows together. So, um, trying to instill that, kind of work ethic and, and the idea that you can do that is you don't just have to wait around for a performer to say, hey, I want to commission you and here's a ton of money. You know, it's like, that's not really... The right, right. Well, wow. that's, that's interesting. I mean, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I, I played very poorly in a jazz combo at the University of Missouri and uh, each jazz combo had the assignment each semester. The, the one assignment was get a gig and then play the gig. Mm. For for each combo, had to you know work up enough material to perform somewhere off campus and perform there. But so it sounds a lot like this this project thing, and the, the, actually the project thing sounds more interesting, and it sounds more <laughs> like um, you're incorporating a lot of that into the curriculum. This was just yeah. kind of like go figure this out. Um, yeah, and you know, and we'll be there to help guide that. And and the way we set it up, where there's a senior project manager and a, and a sort of secondary or assistant project manager, you know, the juniors and seniors can kind of teach the freshmen and sophomores 
And then that will hopefully just kind of roll forward so that in the end, it's kind of just doing, it's working on its own. And we just need to, as faculty, just need to check in every now and then. And, and are and those help. concerts going to be a part of this series as well? Um, I think they, I think they will be. I think they're going to be, depending on what they are, the ear candy concerts might fall un under that. We need to, you know, because this is probably not going to start probably till the year after next, actually, when the new curriculum kicks in. So, mm -hmm. but it's also, I mean, there are also student concerts. So there's a new group that started last year, the Society of Composers and Songwriters, and they do four concerts a year of of just student works. Um, you know, there's the ear candy stuff. There's also individual recitals. We have one graduate student and who is just amazing to me that he's he has basically written an hour long oratorio for solo baritone, chamber orchestra, and double choir. Wow! And he's pulled he pulled this ensemble together, and this concert's happening um, next month. So I'm just like, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm because we were talking about it. And I'm like, you know, that's a lot of pizza you have to buy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Like, I totally support you doing this, and I think it's a really cool project. Let's talk about practicality for a minute. And he's like, yeah, I know, but I just think it's the thing to do. I'm like, awesome, and he's totally done it. So, <laughs> wow. He didn't think it was going to be quite as long, but, um, you know, it's a cool piece. Sometimes it happens. Based on shape note music, which is really great. So Based cool. on what? Shape note music. Oh, cool. Love it. He actually sings in a shape note group, so that group is... I love that stuff. It's a really cool piece, and it's also about the Battle of Winchester from the Civil War. He's a big history, so it's a really cool project. It's all these diary entries, and so he's he can he can use that to leverage the community outreach, you know, which is something that schools want yeah. students and faculty to do. Yeah. Right, it's a really cool thing to do, you know, outside on on the walking mall. I mean, if it didn't have like ten thousand people in it, <laughs> that might. <laughs> <be great. laughs> so, David, something I was curious about. Uh, uh, David McDonald <laughs> mentioned that this was a uh, huge undertaking, and it is. But uh, the other thing is, it's huge from a um, financial point of view. Um, yeah. So obviously, you're not being hung out to dry by your administration and the department. So you're no. getting some support, I assume. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this position was created by the dean, uh, Dean Michael Stepniak, uh, who's been amazingly supportive, and I think it it really for him fulfills a mission um, conservatory wide in terms of ways to bring attention to Shenandoah. And we were talking about this a little before with uh, Grand Valley, you know, and it's, um, I think it's, well, so far it seems to be working and we'll see, you know, how it continues, but he's very supportive. And also Sloan McRae, who is the director of the conservatory performance series. Uh, he's been amazing and, and helping to co-curate, a lot of this. So I, you know, he, you know, with Alarm Will Sound, that was actually, he was the one that suggested that we bring Alarm Will Sound 1969 because I think I would have initially thought, well, that's such an expensive show and it'd be amazing, but how could we afford it? And he was like, oh no, we'll do it. That's really important because that is both a music event and a theater event. So for him as a presenter, it's great. So yeah, the, the support has been really really terrific and I think it's you know this year is a really big year because it's the first year I think probably moving forward it won't be quite as you know it'll kind of even out a little bit and won't be quite so uh, spectacular <laughs> in the spectacle <laughs> sense Yeah, uh, but I think it'll I, you know my hope is that it'll continue to be consistently strong and you know we're looking at uh, actually the next two years already um, trying to plan and starting to do commissions and you know so some, nice. some stuff on the horizon. It's real exciting. That's great. So no. I'm curious about, so you, we kind of touched on it a minute ago with regard to uh, your student uh, your, stu your student history buff slash composer uh, slash orchestra organizer. Right. Um, it, and how his piece was gonna, could, could potentially be a nice point of community engagement because, uh, you know, in, 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 in that area in the dc and virginia area there's a lot of interest in yeah. history and particularly the period of history that shape note singing comes from um and and i'm wondering with regard to this concert series how how much you are concerned you said earlier that you're really concerned that it's um a great educational experience for your students 
And I'm I'm wondering how much effort you're also putting into um, bringing in members of the community. Obviously, if you put uh, alarm will sound in enough press releases, you'll you'll draw a certain audience. Sure. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm wondering if there's any any more direct uh, community outreach going on for this kind of thing because it seems like if you're putting on this level of of performance that it seems like you almost have to be if you're bringing in these kinds of artists yeah. um that 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 could be a really valuable project to to work with the community on yeah i think there are two answers to that um the first is that you know we are really a sort of the furthest west extension of dc at this point mm -hmm. um this you know dc is just continuously expanding this in this direction and so we're now kind of on the the cusp of that and so in one sense that's that's one community that we're really interested in and that's you know being part of the andreessen 75 festival with atlas theater and and great noise and you know that's really um i think strathmore also is involved in that you know so that's that's one thing um but it's also really in in a more direct sense i think really about winchester as a as a community you know this this brightbox partnership is is a brand new thing and this last night was actually the first conservatory event that we hosted there and it was something that we worked on all last year kind of figuring out what a partnership would look like and you know trying to broker that and one of the reasons i thought it was really important to do that um, was to have concerts in town, you know, that are conservatory events, but are that that are in the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, <laughs> you know, we did a lot of local press for the event last night. A lot of you know newspaper stories in the local paper, and we had um, the composers and I for about the two hours before the show walked around the walking mall handing out flyers and stuff. You know, so we're definitely trying to. to you know, it's, we don't want this to be something that's just for the conservatory or just for the students. It's really, it's really for everyone in the community, um, and that's also why doing you know NC is really about community. Doing Unsilent Night, where anyone can participate if they can bring a boombox, or we're going to buy a bunch of boomboxes too. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm definitely very interested in that component. I mean, community in general is really important to me. I mean, the whole New Music Bake Sale is all about that. You know, so. That's always something I'm thinking about. And, and, you know, given the turnout last night, I feel like, because it was really cool, because the turnout was really good, but it wasn't like it was all faculty and students. I mean, there were people that we didn't know, you know, meet um, people from the area. That's who, exciting. So yeah. I think we're off to a good start in that, in that way. Yeah, actually, my next question was going to be about the Bright Box Theater. I pulled up their website, and... You know, this is uh, not your not the place you expect to hear classical music typically. Right. Right. Um, so that's good. I mean, right. it's it's good to suggest to people that this is new music, but because of just the very place you're holding it, right. it's the kind of thing they might want to go to because it's like they have comedians and they have jam yeah. grass bands and they have totally. you know open mics. Yeah. Is really, streaming streaming of concerts available from from the theater? I don't think it's available yet, but they're working on it. Cool. It's definitely it's definitely something that they've been talked about talking about. They they have it set up now so that the concerts they have monitors outside in the lobby and so shows are being sort of broadcast around the building and right. it's actually part of a big complex. There are office spaces in it and um, but I think the streaming is is on the horizon. It's definitely something right. I think is, is would be great for it you know so. right and exactly i mean it certainly will will increase the reach i'm not, i don't have numbers for how um how much it increases the reach for lpr but i know yeah. a lot of people do tune in when they have yeah. some, some yeah really interesting events happening totally and you know i mean we're, we're working on that i think with the andreessen stuff i think q2 is involved oh, in cool. in not in live broadcasting but in broadcasting recordings so yeah. we were we are looking at those and trying to reach you know, beyond the DC Winchester community into the. If for anybody that's not familiar, Q2 is the secondary <clears throat> digital station for WQXR New York Public Radio, and they do a lot of really cool new music stuff, both on their terrestrial digital signal and uh, probably more familiar to those of us that don't live in in their uh, footprint is on the web. 
So you should check them out. Yeah, it's a really great, I mean, they do great work. And it's just, you know, it allows you to hear pieces that, you know, you can't necessarily hear otherwise if you're not able to get to the show. You know, I was just thinking with the BBC, having the chance to hear the the premiere of the new Zhevsky Piano Concerto. Yeah. So the great. Yeah. yeah, it was just, that was... Great piece. It was an amazing piece. I think it's one of his best pieces. I mean, I was really into it, and... um but just a chance to hear it, you know, I love the, I love the future. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things that used to, is, is becoming less of a problem. It's still kind of a problem is that we, we hear about all these great pieces going on all over the place and the best that, and, that we can usually hope to do is like read a review. You know, if, if I wanted to know how your show went last night, I can ask you, I can read a review or I'll I'll just assume that it went well, and and if you had some you know great premiere on there, that would have been you know something that I don't I just don't get to hear ever. Um, uh, you know, I've, we've been reading every couple of months for the last two or three years we've been doing the show. We read a story about John Luther Adams and Ixuit. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I've never heard it, but I feel like I know a lot of stuff about it. It's just right. because there's some big group, some big performance of it every couple of months, and it gets written up in wherever the blogosphere that I read, which is admittedly a pretty strange place. Um, and I, I you, still you, have never heard have, the piece. You have like one minute YouTube clips that you can check out. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> so where you have like the one percussionist who's totally disproportionately loud to everything right. else. Right. Yeah. Somebody's walking around with their iPhone, and it's like all, you know. Arm stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, it's like watching J.J. Abrams shooting uh, John Adams' performance at the Armory or something. Lots of lens flare. Right, that's what that's what we're missing is lens flare in this recording. Uh, I'm really and, and then about- so, like in a, like next month or something, there's going to be a commercial recording of it. Yeah, and I yeah. don't understand how that's going to. I'm really curious to gel see with what I understand about the piece from reading about it for the last couple of years. Yeah. But anyway, my point was, it's really great that, that you're that you're looking into this and that, that other people are looking into it because this, for example, this music series that you're working on in Shenandoah sounds wonderful, and I I live in Florida, so too bad, <laughs> right. too bad for me. Well, and I think, yeah, I mean, I think this is if we can get past the the kind of hardware issues that are part of it. And, you know, just get to a point where this sort of technology is not necessarily prohibitively expensive, which I think is one of the difficulties. I think it's not cheap. I don't totally know, but that's my my understanding. Um, to do it well, like to do it at the quality that LPR does it. Um, if we can get past that just collectively, I think it's going to be, I mean, it's already an exciting time with what you can find online, but um, it'll even be more exciting. What's better than more exciting? <laughs> yeah, Even well, we, we at Sound Notion are doing our part to try to break that, break those Absolutely. barriers, and and someday, someday, I would love to take the show on the road and stream some live performances. This is this is a, awesome. a, a, a long term goal for us. This, this has been talked about since day one. Yeah, Sound it's, Notion it's, dream. It's yeah, it's true. It's been it's literally been talked about since the day we started doing the show. So. Sort of the nucleus of the show. One of the nuclei of the show was was webcasting um, composer concerts. That's, yeah, that's and, how we got into streaming was streaming shows that we were doing in graduate well, school. And and when you know when when you don't have a certain level of professional quality, you have to hit. And and you know people should just be damn happy that they're getting something. Right. <laughs> I mean, you can do that fairly inexpensively, and and right. it's and it's that's just an example of another thing that students should be into because. Yeah. Learning how to do it well, you first have to start learning how to do it, period. And yeah. that's what we did. Well, and also, I think what I've experienced in speaking with people about it is that it's not necessarily understood universally that it's kind of something you need to do now. Like, the idea of re- like having good video from a performance, <clears throat> you know, you talk to some people and they're like, oh, that would be really good it's like no 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 <laughs> you have to have that you need to have that you so last night we made sure we had a videographer so there will be there should be a, i haven't seen the video yet but i'm hoping we'll be able to put the whole performance online i mean that's well, my us, no we'd love to link to it yeah, yeah no i definitely will i definitely will and I, i'm sorry i was hoping i could maybe get something by today but it's no it's you know, cool 
in like 12 hours. So it wasn't just <laughs> the bed, stay up all night editing. And, and um, I would yeah. imagine that most of those 12 hours were spent sleeping. Right. I hope. <laughs> At least some of them. Are but, there any plans to release, release record, uh, commercial audio recordings in any of this? Not at the moment, but <clears throat> I, that's something I'm always interested in, in exploring. I think it gets tricky when you deal with institutions. Yeah. Because it's the question of, you know, um, like I'd be curious how that works with the Grand Valley recordings, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, just institutionally. Because I think on the one hand, it's a great way of marketing the institution. On the other hand, it it's, gets into this sort of interesting free labor question and, you know, um, and also, it's just you know, it's expensive. Yeah. To do a yeah. really high level recording, so right. w you know who pays for that and <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. See, there's just another reason why you and Bill Ryan need to get together. Bill, yeah, totally. I, I know you're watching the show right now. Right. Yeah. You, you and David need to get together. We do. <laughs> we do. Yeah. Um, and you know, and and it, if you do it right, you'll end up getting all that Teen Wolf money like Bill Ryan did. Right, right. <laughs> so, the, what was it? The, the piece that was used in the uh, MTV new version of Teen Wolf. Anyway, it was the show title when we had Bill Ryan on. Oh, cool. yeah. Uh, a version uh, was it? Eighteen musicians. I don't remember. Anyway, oh, so cool. one of their recordings was used very briefly in the MTV's Teen Wolf. So okay. that's what you have to look forward to. Dude. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's. It just. I think it's a question of how do those numbers all work out, and what goes where, and what comes from where. It's just a just it's just a discussion to have, but I think definitely I know the wind ensemble uh Damon Talley, the conductor he's commissioning a ton of works and he wants to record those and release those so there's definitely something that we've talked about. we just got to work out. I just want to get through this season first, yeah right yeah <laughs> one step at a time yeah <laughs> so David, other than this massive undertaking that is this uh series which sounds fantastic and we're actually looking to have some people uh at least one person i know third coast percussion i've been in conversation oh, about cool. getting them on the show awesome. i've been a little remiss in getting back to them over the past week but i'll do that today cool. um so we'll plug the show again because they're coming up uh i think by the end of the year right they're here just to be, I think, January 31st. Okay, well, like just, yeah. just after the beginning of the year. Yeah. But so what else, what's up for you? In addition to reorganizing the curriculum and starting this awesome project, you're a composer, is that yeah. right? Right. I, I, yes. I understand that you write the music. Yes. So what's going on with you in that front? Uh, well, let's see. I'm currently they're finish, I'm finishing two pieces right now. One is a really big string quartet for Kronos, which is about a 30-minute piece. That's going to premiere in Ann Arbor in January. So that's finished, and I'm just kind of, you know, editing the score and double checking that I actually meant everything I wrote. And um, it's called Agency, and it's about, um, topically enough, um, sort of NSA, CIA stuff. <laughs> mm. oh. and, um, and, but in a sort of strange kind of way, it also deals with Aboriginal creation myths in Australia. Um, the forming of the Five Eyes spy network, which is Australia, New Zealand, US, UK, and Canada, um, and specifically a base in Alice Springs, Australia, called Pine Gap, which has been in the news in some in Australia. It's been in the in the news a bit, um, but then also Walt Whitman kind of makes an appearance, and Benjamin Franklin. It's a very it's the piece is all, <laughs> it's all about secrecy and obscuring information so there are all the the whole piece is constructed of ciphers so what uh, kind of list do you get on when you write a piece like this what kind of nsa uh, list yeah. sure list i was already on <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's funny when i when i was talking with david harrington about it he's like i really i want to i want to have the biggest FBI file of any string quartet member in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they do. You probably already do, you know. Uh, I mean, you've, you've done stuff with Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky. You're on some list. Um, but yeah, I, so that's kind of, that's been really interesting, and it's, it's been a different kind of process for me because, like I said, I said, it's all these codes. So having, you know, having Morse code and then having to make music out of it was finding different kinds of ciphers. Um, you know, there's this one part that I'm really excited about where I've redacted notes. So it's like <laughs> a big 
was in the score over notes. And the, the quartet just does scrapes there. Um, so I'm hoping that sounds like I think it'll sound. But so it's been really, it's been really fun and interesting. But it's, that you know, it's great. a big 30 minutes. So it's a, lot of, it's a lot of pages and a lot of notes to check. Um, and then I'm doing a shorter piece, um, uh, two songs from an, uh, an sort of in-progress opera theater. He's called Arto in the Black Lodge. About an imaginary meeting in the Bardo between Antonin Artaud, William Burroughs, and David Lynch. All right. <laughs> Basically, um, that's that's being written for uh, a rock band, just you know, guitar based nice. voice, and that's premiering at the 21st Century Liederabend at BAM on the 22nd of November. November, yeah. Cool. Is that yeah, that's going to be a great event. There's like what. 17 composers or something being represented 12 premieres or something yeah all right more projects and paolo prestini and bam i mean it's a really julian walkner is conducting a bunch of stuff and his new music ensemble is the house band so it's a cool it's gonna be a cool event i'm excited about it but i have to finish the, the piece <laughs> <laughs> um so those things there's a, i'm writing a short piece after that for my advisor for a show in March, and then it's then it's on to JFK, which is the big. That's going to be all of the next year, pretty much. So this is this. I'm writing an opera for Fort Worth Opera about JFK's final 15 hours. Wow. wow! Nice, nice. So this is for the 50th anniversary of the assassination. Yeah, but it, it won't premiere until 2016, so we'll miss that. But which I think is probably fine because it's it's not really about the assassination; it's about the people and. Um, and they're, they're sort of, it's a kind of very spiritual take on, the, you know, the, um, on Jackie and, and Kennedy and their life. And so it, hopefully it'll transcend the, the event itself. It's our goal with it. But it's been really interesting to get into, you know, researching the personalities of these Texas politicians like John Connolly and Jim Wright. It's been sort of, been sort of something I never thought I would be doing, but has been pretty fun. It's really interesting, uh, and, and I, I'll, this is a really interesting thing that we kind of touched on the last time you were on the show. Uh, we talked about your uh, kind of, I, what, are we calling it a song cycle, a chamber opera, soldier songs? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sure, well, one of those things. But, right. but it was it was really addressing a lot of current events very, very directly, and a lot of new music is, is not doing those things. Um, you know, the, we, we had a... A, a Pulitzer winning opera about war a few years ago from Kevin Putz, and it was about World War One. Um, and and I think it's really interesting that you're addressing a lot of issues in 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 current politics. And and we we kind of talked on this uh, the last time you were on the show. But I, I was wondering, could say can you say something about you know how you see your role as a composer uh, in in what in a lot of ways is a relatively you know, insular medium uh, of contemporary concert music uh, addressing these large societal issues uh, that a lot of composers, myself included, tend to ignore in our music. You know, I just think it's... um, These issues are things that are important to me personally, and, and they really more and more, and I think we talked about this a little bit with Soldier Songs, you know, they get less... I mean, they're still specific in a way, but they also get more concerned with like existential stuff or metaphysics. You know, it's more about much bigger questions that we can get to through these topics. Yes. Um, so, you know, the string quartet for Kronos, I mean, it's called agency, which is sort of a, has a double meaning of, you know, referencing the NSA and the CIA, but also the sort of philosophical idea of agency and choice and really do we have that anymore? And to or to what extent do we have that in the current uh, security climate right. or intelligence climate? And that's, I think, in, uh, that's an important question to be asking for me. I think it's it's interesting and I think important, but I think it's also more interesting in general than just saying, "Hey, did you know the CIA is listening to our phone calls?" <laughs> <laughs> like we get that stuff from the news, you know. And that's important to know also. But, you know, it's like I remember when I was studying with Bill Bolcom and I was actually writing 
uh, I think I was writing soldier songs, I was starting it, and he said, you know, I don't need a piece of music to tell me that war is bad. I know, like that, <laughs> and I, I think about that a lot, so it's like, okay, if we're not saying that war is bad, or if we're not saying, you know, there are, you know, homegrown spy agencies that are listening to our phone calls, what can we get from those that are, that is actually a deeper, a deeper issue, or a deeper thing, or a, something that will um, reach a deeper place in us spiritually or, you know, or emotionally or whatever. Um, you know, lately I've been talking a lot with Royce Vavrick, who's my librettist writing partner, about projects that we do. And um, There you go, David. You were talking about the NSA and all that stuff. That's perfect. So, uh, cool. So... So you, the NSA. You were telling us before <laughs> oh, yes. we were cut off by who knows. Our you were security. telling us about the NSA, David. Well, no. What I was saying, I think, is that you know, with Royce Vavrick, um, but the librettist I work with, um, we talk a lot about. You know, we have this whole list of projects that we want to do, and th- what we've been talking about lately is the idea of of having, um, being able to say in a single word or in a single sentence, what a piece is really about. And that pushes us, I think, toward these bigger questions, you know, where you could say that a piece is about freedom, or a piece is about autonomy, or a piece is, you know, any, anything that <clears throat> is a simple word that represents a very complex idea. And then that allows you, that allows us then as a team to go into that and, you know, write a piece that has actually has a lot of nuance and a lot of complexity, but is all in service of this one single important idea. And so for me, agency is kind of that as well, you know, this idea of choice and the idea of secrecy. Um, these are all things that really I then explore through these sort of strange other things, you know, like uh, through creation myths from, you know, Aboriginal Australia and things like that. So... So and that's how you get. That's how you strive to go beyond what you were saying earlier. That that yeah. you know, war is bad. It's not an interesting right. piece of music. Right. So you know, the piece isn't necessarily about what the piece seems to be about on its surface. It's actually about something that's that's much bigger than that. But all of the surface detail and all of the choices are really service. You know, being done in the service of that big idea. And that's been that's been really satisfying to me. And I think you know, has been working in, in terms of the pieces. So I think we'll keep doing that. And it, it's cool because it can kind of be, the ideas don't have to be these really austere philosophical ideas. They can be anything, you know, like we have a piece, Vinkensport. And we were, when we were talking about this, we, he said, well, what is Vinkensport about? And I said, oh, it's about loneliness. He was like, oh, yeah, it totally is, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, and that's, so that's, that's something that we all experience at some point, and that's something that I think is worthy of an artistic exploration. But then the story itself is this ridiculous story about a Belgian folk sport where people listen to birds sing. You know, like you wouldn't necessarily know from reading the synopsis that it's really about loneliness. But when you. When you. Hmm. We lost you for a minute. Oh, we lost you entirely, David. <sighs> we might punt on the stories just because we got to get through the interview. You guys back? Yes. Yeah, we can hear. Yes. You. you were just telling us what happens when you do something. Oh, you, I don't when you read the. You said it doesn't something about reading the the synopsis doesn't something, but when you. Oh yeah. When, so when you read the synopsis of, of this piece, you wouldn't necessarily, you know, it wouldn't necessarily say this is a piece about loneliness. It describes this sort of ridiculous story about these kind of wacky characters. I mean, it's a comedy, basically. But then it gets to the core of the piece. There's this one aria in particular where it really drives that home, and you're like, oh, I, I understand now. And that recontextualizes everything that came before it in the piece. So, um, And th- that, playing with those levels is really satisfying and really fun. For me, um, so that's that's sort of where I am with that stuff at the moment. 
Well, that that all sounds really interesting, and we would love to 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 have you on to talk about some of these these pieces as they're as they're coming to fruition sometime. Uh, sure. But uh, I think we need we need to start heading toward the wrap up. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of couple of news stories before we before we head out. Uh, first of all, big one. Uh, New York City Opera has announced that they're <laughs> in pretty bad shape, which is a bummer because they do such really interesting work and really interesting projects, and they made some major changes just a few seasons ago uh, to cut back on their season and to cut back on their personnel. They're almost all per service now. They don't have uh, very many, if any, full-time uh, players and musicians and singers and other people like that that they that they employ. Uh, and it apparently hasn't worked out for them, even though now they're they're cut back to just like I think four productions this season. Yeah. Um, the first of which, the American premiere of uh, Mark Anthony Turnage's Anna Nicole, uh, should be happening pretty next soon week. next week. Two days, I think it opens. Yeah, I think it's seventeenth. Yeah, but they've announced that if they don't uh, raise another was it twenty million dollars by the end of the year. They're going to have to cancel the rest of this season and all of next season because they won't be able to afford to stay open, which is bananas. And for a city like New York to continue to be one of the cultural capitals of the world, one would think that it should be able to support two opera companies, at least two yeah. opera companies, right? right. Other um, cities do it. Other, well, sure. London does it. Berlin does it. Yeah. Hell, other cities in the United States do it. Yeah. Um, uh, but this is this is it's not working out for City Opera. They it has come to this. They have a Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're yeah. they're wanting to raise a million dollars in the next like two weeks or so. They 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 their deadline for their Kickstarter is September end of September. So um, if if you want to help City Opera stick around, uh, now interestingly, from what I can tell, there there is no indication that they are interested in changing directions. Nobody is saying that this this new model that they're trying. Well, that's not true. Nobody inside the organization is saying that this new model that they're trying has failed. There are some outside observers that are saying that this this idea of of scaling everything back and scaling everyone back may not have been a successful uh, plan, um, but they're sticking with the current executive director. The board still is supporting them, so we'll see what happens. It would be really sad to lose such uh, an interesting and adventurous uh, opera company in in New York City. Um, do you guys have any thoughts? There was an interesting uh, opinion. Piece published in the blog, the Schleppy Nabucco's Opera Gonzo blog. Uh, and, forwarded. And when I want opera news, I go to <laughs> Schleppy Nabucco. Well, I, this was forwarded from Anne Majet, so that's it. Ha I gave it credence because of that. That's all. That's all the credence you need. And the the person here is obviously an opera fan, and they normally are a subscriber, and they're just belly aching, and I think rightfully so, over how. We got this far into things without knowing there was an issue, and uh, yeah. So like, like you get to September 9th without knowing that you're going to need to raise seven million dollars by the end of that month. How does that happen? You know, suggesting that there's some disingenuous behavior going on, you know, in the administration. Um, Either that or incompetence. And well, yes, and or incompetence, and also raising the question that, like. Talking about how the opera sells that the company sells itself, and talking about how if you pay this such and such subscription, you get to go to this lavish, extravagant party, and so if they're this bad off financially, why are they still focusing on that kind of you know go along with it, where it's about lavish, extravagant parties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? It's just an interesting look at the situation from a, a really hardcore opera fan's point of view, the kind of person who normally buys a subscription and that kind of thing. And we'll have a link to that in the notes. That's, that's actually, you brought up something that I forgot to mention. So th they 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 need to raise seven million dollars by the end of the month. Yeah. Yes. And then another thirteen million dollars for a total of twenty by the end of the year. I yes. think if they don't raise the seven, then then the rest of the season after Anna Nicole is canceled. That's right. Correct. And then if they don't raise the thirteen, then the next season is canceled. Right. 
Yeah, there was, a, there was that thing on, was it on Gawker, about you should feed, you shouldn't give money to the opera, you should feed starving children. Yeah, I actually, I had a Twitter argument with a guy about that. Yeah, I mean, that, that article was really problematic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the two things are not mutually exclusive to begin yeah, with. I mean, and second of all, the idea that opera is for fancy people is BS, and I and we talk about that on the show all the time, about how frustrating it is to convince people that the arts are worthwhile and not for people that wear white tie to formal events. Right. right. Well, I was, I was kind of playing devil's advocate in my Twitter argument with this guy, because the, the article makes the point... Rich, the basically rich people have to decide where to donate money, and you know if they donate money to to this, even though they're not directly comparable, you can feed all these hungry children. And if you donate it to an opera company, what do you get in return? Mm-hmm. Can, can I sort just of doing point a, out a cost benefit analysis that way? On the Kickstarter, somebody did donate ten thousand dollars for a walk on walk on role in the <laughs> their, this performance of the oh, piece. That's cool. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> That was me. Uh, You're welcome. That wasn't. wasn't. I will be making my New York City Opera debut. Nice. (laughs) So this is what you'll get for your money. In in other news, I would like to announce that I'll be making my New York City Opera debut uh, (laughs) later this month in in Anna Nicole. No, uh, but so the thing that blows my mind is how, and and this is Sam. You were mentioning this earlier. If if they they should have known this was going to be a problem before, and why didn't somebody? Pay ten thousand dollars to get in a walk on roll earlier. Like, why didn't this happen in, you know, March or July? Like, why is why is this happening now in September? It seems like somebody is. From what I read, there there's a internal ten million dollar fundraising campaign with amongst donors and board members that didn't go the way it was supposed to, or the way people was going to, and I think that's. At least from what I had read, that's the source of this. So I think it was, you know, when you're building these budgets, and I'm just thinking back to, you know, doing Mata stuff, you know, you're building these budgets and you say, oh, donations, X thousands of dollars. And then it happen, you're like, okay, huh. You know? <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> fell, they, they, they had a project that fell, uh, a fundraising project that fell way short. Like it made half yeah. of, of what it was, yeah. what, what they were hoping it would make. Um, uh, but I shouldn't they have known that before that before two? I don't think it was. I, I mean, don't think this whole thing is as big as a surprise as as maybe some people think it is. I mean, it, well, no, uh, it's not really like it's, it's the surprise emergency thing. Yes, I but mean, I mean, it's no, it's no. Everyone knows that, like you know, City Opera has had a rough few years. Yeah, you know, trying right. to rebuild, trying to rebrand, trying to you know change their whole image. It's no like secret that 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 is very much an issue right now but i mean yeah perhaps you know right in the middle right before you start the first production of the season you know that's a that's an interesting question right yeah uh, but there know, also is something to be said for making it seem dire you yeah know? Right. that's true i mean the, the you know, it, it could just be strategic and i mean I, it sounds terrible to say that but there's something to be said for emergencies you know right. This is an SOS. We yeah. need your help now, or the opera is going to go under, right? Send it I think out the, an SOS from the New York City Opera. I mean, and I think what's hard is when, and you know, and this is something. I mean, Mott is a much smaller organization, obviously. Like God, if we ever had one million dollars, that'd be amazing. But you know, <laughs> the idea that um, I just totally lost my train of thought. It happens. Uh, sorry. Wow. It's NSA uh, brain manipulation. Yeah, right. Things. That microchip <laughs> put in my head. It's just like, it's like, happening. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry. I mean, there's that's fine. Too. There's, there's, I mean, you're right. There's something to be said for the the uh, the marketing angle, the publicity angle of this emergency. Um, I remember what it was. What were you going to say? I was just going to say there there becomes an issue when the emergency state becomes the default state yeah. but it's always an emergency and then i think people like they, orchestra strikes and things like that yeah you can no, no just like financial like we need we're in danger of not being able to do this and it's like again yeah just we just helped you guys you know yeah. so there is this fatigue and and i think we also we experience that with kickstarter in general where 
everyone, you know, there's that Kickstarter fatigue thing where everyone, everyone always needs money for their project, and you're just like, oh my god, there are a thousand projects, all of which are really great, but can I support them all? No, and you just kind of, it kind of grays out a little bit. So it's 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 tough. I mean, City Opera, it's the whole thing makes me really sad because without City Opera and the Vox program, I wouldn't be writing opera at all. Like, right. that's you know, having those opportunities to work with those singers and to just be a part of that world. Right. You know, I mean, the Mets the, not doing these kinds of projects. Not the same in the same way. I mean, they have their they have you know, internal development stuff that they do. Um, but it's not, it's not quite the same, you know, and it's not a performance. So having the chance to, I mean, I think the first time soldier songs was ever reviewed in the New York times, it was because of Vox, you know, and that got the word out about that piece and, and put me in touch. You know, the, the guy, Jim Bobick, who sang the father's role in dog days when we did it last year, I met him doing Vox the City Opera, the guy who played the, one of the sons in Dog Days, sang Vinkensport at Vox at City Opera, you know, so it's really, I mean, my whole opera community has come out of, of you know, because of the City Opera community, so it's really, yeah. and I think, I think that's, and for me, that's one of the most important things that, I mean, the productions are great, but having, you know, again, it goes back to community, like having a place that's really a community of young emerging singers, um, and, you know, I think largely American singers who are, you know, based in the States, it just, it allows you to, to build a family, um, around operatic work and it'd be a shame if that can't continue. So I hope they pull it off. It's, it's tough, but, you know, yeah. where's, call Mike Bloomberg. <laughs> oh. In good news for classical music, um, Recently, there, there's a story in uh, uh, CBC Music about Blurred Lines, composed in 1997 by Canadian composer John Beckwith. Um, uh, the Alan, what's his name? What's his name? Uh, uh, Thick. Robin uh, Thick. Robin Thick. Robin Thick. I like Thick. Alan Thick, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite Robin, the same. Yeah, Robin Thick of uh, Miley Cyrus twerking fame. Um, <laughs> We and we've been sitting on this story for a while. We were we forgot to cover it after we came back from vacation. Yeah. Right, um, it comes. It, it happens to have written a piece of the same name because of this. Blurred lines. This piece by John Beckwith has gone crazy with sales. Um, nothing more to report except what a happy coincidence and congratulations, yeah. John Beckwith. That's awesome. Right? <laughs> That's not how I want to win, though. I don't care. <laughs> I want to win stuff like that. If you have any confusions with my titles, first of all, there are some real weird pop titles. But uh, I like the, the soccer team take, scores I'll on itself. I'll take what I can get. Yeah, I'll take what I can get. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and real quick before we go, I did want to follow up. Last week we talked about the American Federation of Musicians Local 802 sending out a questionnaire about new music, uh, and and we talked about kind of the hostile tone of of the questionnaire. Uh, they have actually issued kind of a, a retraction Correction. is not the right word, but uh, a, a, um, a clarification. And, and they, they wanted to, uh, they said, let's see, we heard from some musicians that the way the question was phrased may have been disrespectful towards new music. That was certainly not our intention. And if we offended anyone, we'd like to apologize. We'd still like to know your thoughts on 21st century repertoire. And we'd love to hear from composers also. Which is interesting because the AFM does not represent composers, which is a topic that we could get into for a whole extra show about how com there's no union style representation for composers or songwriters unless they also play instruments um but they, they, they've reworded this to how can composers and performers work together in developing the future of the repertoire which i think is a much more constructive way to 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 word this question and a, a much more interesting question than the questions that they asked and and in a lot of ways it's a question that we ask on this show almost every week um uh we could we could even call that question kind of the thesis for our our show so um congratulations right. to the afm thank you to to the afm for and for correcting that and congratulations to a friend of the show rob deemer who 
for <laughs> making a sink. Yeah. Saying solely responsible, I don't know, but largely responsible, let's say, because of his new music box piece uh, about this uh, questionnaire to begin with and the questions he raised about it as getting the ball rolling on raising enough uproar to make them reword the question. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the, the idea of the, of, of, of the AFM, a union that represents performers, even engaging with composers, I think, is, is a really positive thing in general. When we, when we talked about the creation of New Music USA and the merging of AMC and Composers Forum and all these things uh, a couple of years ago, we, we saw some town hall meetings that they were doing explaining what was going on. And the, in, the, in the town hall meeting that they did in New York City, uh, th- there were a lot of questions from people asking about how this new service organization might do things along the lines of what the the AFM does for performers and i think that that the the lack of that kind of organization for composers is is an interesting topic for discussion um so maybe that's something we can take up at a later date but we we need to wrap this one up David, thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any yeah, uh, you any shows coming up that you want to plug? I know we we talked about a lot of shows, but uh, anything yeah, coming up immediately? October October seventeenth, I think, is there's a there's a show at Spectrum with a song cycle in New York, and then I'm also I have a, a short piece as part of this Cage One Hundred thing with 124 other composers. It's like an exquisite <laughs> corpse thing that's going to be at Miller Theater also on the seventeenth. So. Well, and then look forward to this. October 10th is the next Edge Ensemble concert. Um, Excellent. So that, should be, that should be fun. Excellent. Yeah, well, it thanks was, so much it for was delightful us. as always talking to you. Yeah. You too. Thanks so much. And, and we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you Definitely. to everyone who, who watched or listened to the show. Thanks especially to those of you who are watching live and participating in chat. That's always fun and we enjoy uh, seeing your thoughts. Uh, and, and we encourage anyone to come watch or listen to the show. You can check out the stream at soundnotion.tv slash live. We start around 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, and you'll get to see all of our behind-the-scenes technical problems that occur when Skype decides that for whatever reason it doesn't like us or the NSA doesn't like <laughs> us talking about music that is about them. So I still think it was Royce. It was Royce Fabric. Something oh, happened. Yeah? He's deep as soon in the machine. His name it got shut down. <laughs> Okay. Well, well, we'll watch out for him, too, next time. So you can yeah. do that 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, check your local listings, soundnotion.tv slash live on the interwebs. Um, if We would encourage you all to engage with us on the social media machine. Uh, this conversation about all these interesting topics shouldn't stop when we stop recording the show. Uh, if you have any thoughts or if you'd like to read about any of the stories we talked about, you can go to soundnotion.tv slash SN and read about our show notes. You can leave a comment. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. If you'd like to suggest a story for us to talk about on the show, you can do that on our site or you can do that just by tweeting us a link. Use hashtag SN Weekly and we always look at that when we're putting together our show for the week. Uh, and it should be mentioned that Facebook recognizes hashtags now. It, it is true. Facebook does do hashtags so you can hashtag <laughs> things on on facebook as well um you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at sound notion tv in the itunes store so go ahead and do that and be on the lookout for a new show about electronic music coming up soon from us called patch in it's it's shaping up to be very interesting um <laughs> If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by using the links on the right side of our site. If you use the uh, the Amazon to buy anything at all, you can uh, use that search box, and we get a little commission. It doesn't look or feel or cost anything different to you, but it helps us out a little bit, and we really appreciate that. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching or listening. We appreciate audio listeners as well, and we'll see you back next week. Big Brother is watching.